get the pages organized. Like, and this is a new talk, so I'm occasionally going to look at this lectern to figure out where I am. All right. If I click, you're a miracle, Matt. Thank you. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, Justin, thank you. That was, that was great. I only wish that I had talked to you or seen your slides before mine, because there were some <laughs> things I would have adjusted. This is not really about tech. Um, but it's going to be a little bit tech heavy, and I realize that some people in the room are technologists, some are not. Uh, I will try not to rely too much on background technical knowledge. Um, if I say something that just doesn't make sense, uh, don't wait for the Q&A, like shoot up your hand and throw something at me and I'll, I'll clarify. None of it should be like, you know, programming jargon or anything like that. Um, uh, just so I can get to know who's in the room, how many of you are uh, working directly with OpenEdX as an open source project, either as a programmer, a documenter. Great, okay. Yeah, roughly half. Um, how many of you, uh, and some hands may go up again, how many of you manage people in such, who are working in that capacity? Quite a lot, okay. Great, thanks. Um, <clears throat> and, and just, okay, last one. How many are working on, uh, have worked on or do now work contribute to open source projects outside the open edX family of projects. Great, okay, this is not this room's first open source rodeo. Glad to see that. All right, um, so quick introduction. Uh, I used to work on a program called CVS, or <laughs> maybe the last poll. Has anyone in here used CVS? Oh my God, <laughs> that is, I expected like at most two hands. That's amazing. Uh, well, we can, all, we can all remember the old times together. Um, I got, uh, from being a programmer, I got interested in um, uh, not just technology, but sort of the social dynamics of how open source projects work. Uh, that led to a second book. Uh, the first one was from the past millennium. This one is from this millennium. Um, and there it is. This one, I'll give the URL, uh, just in case. This is not a product pitch. It's all online for free. You don't have to pay me to get it. Um, you can get it from O'Reilly Media if you want. Um, so. The, uh, the process of working in these projects led me to think sort of about the different kinds of, of uh, infrastructure, um, not just technical infrastructure, licensing infrastructure, social organizational infrastructure. When uh, Ed, where's, where's Ed sitting? Hey, Ed. Um, uh, asked me to come give a keynote. Uh, I did some research in the OpenX project and talked to him a little bit, and I said, what I really like to do is sort of give this grand philosophical talk about open source infrastructure and how organizations work together and what it means for the future of the whole human race and stuff. And uh, to my shock, he sort of nodded, like, oh, okay, that sounds good. So thank you, Ed, <laughs> we'll see. Um, I wanna clarify a couple of points before I go on. For some of you, this will be, uh, you'll understand what I'm referring to here, and for some of you, this will be new, but, but in any case, um, there are a lot of terms for what is essentially the same thing. Some people call it free software. That term predates open source. Um, but people misunderstood it. They thought it meant free of charge. Um, so then somebody coined open source software. Um, and then uh, people, and that, whether that means the same as free software or not is apparently a matter of great debate. In this talk and in general when I speak, they mean the same thing. It's the same set of licenses with some minor exceptions that don't matter in real life. Um, some people just avoid the whole problem by calling it floss. Then someone coined the term Libra, which is wonderful if only it were an English word, and if only English were fundamentally a romance language, but it's not, so that just doesn't work, um, but still we use it. And then so people compromise that into the acronym. So all of these mean exactly the same thing as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> we, won't, uh, we won't get into the details of the funny little licenses that, that are one but not the other, but we can talk about that later in the Q&A if you want. Um, arose by any other name, et cetera. Um, okay, so the basic thesis of what I'd like to talk about is that this, the practice of free software, open source, whatever you want to call it, it depends on, um, first of all, on licensing infrastructure. Um, Richard Stallman uh, famously came up with the GNU Journal of Public License, and, and I think a short time later, the, the so-called Four Freedoms, which we'll go over in a moment. Um, that, that was quickly followed by a lot of technical convention. Like it doesn't, it probably doesn't occur to those of you who like check out source code from a Git repository uh, or, or you know, use a bug tracker or something, that, like, that those are things that, that had to be invented. And of course, if you think about it, you, you realize that. 
But there's, there's a whole lot of um, technical collaboration infrastructure and tools and processes that we're all accustomed to using that, that cannot be taken for granted. There was actually, there was a long period when we had free software with free licenses, but there was no ability to check things out of a repository that, over the internet. That was not a thing. You just like a whole decade or more of that before that kind of became normal. Um, and yet free software sort of worked, but it really transformed once you could start accessing the latest version of the source code and send patches back, or what we now call pull requests or merge requests. Um, so let's, just to get this history fully in perspective and why this matters, we'll, you'll see later. Uh, what are computers even for? Well, they started as, as, as calculating engines. Um, this is Charles, a, a tiny bit from a later construction of Charles Babbage's famous difference engine. And it was quickly realized by, by Babbage himself, by the way, that they weren't just calculators. They could do symbolic manipulation generally. They could be analytical engines. Um, this is one mil, not the entire engine from the analytical engine. Um, uh, quickly, the, they started to take up living rooms, as Justin pointed out. Um, and then something interesting happened. We started attaching uh, sensory apparatus. There was, there was an easier input keyboards. You have the, the blinking lights could give you output in real time. You didn't have to kind of wait for a final result to come out, you know, punched on a tray or something. Um, we got the modern sort of sensory deception device, which provides us with uh, a little rectangle of vision and, and as much sound as you want to turn up your volume to get. And it turns out that all you need to like cause very convincing illusions and weird thoughts in humans is just that. Just take up a little bit of the visual field and their ears. You don't need smell, you don't need, um, you don't really need haptic, you know, kinesthetic response, all that stuff. Just those two senses and only a little bit of the vision is enough. Um, but then we added another sense, which is the net well or all these other components. But <clears throat> um, the really modern incarnation of the computer is that we put them on networks. So now there's another form of input, which is all the other computers and all the other people who are attached to those computers. Um, and this is the environment. <clears throat> Sorry, I woke up a little sore throat, so give me a moment. Um, this is the environment <clears throat> in which free software developed. And for most of that history, the interesting part of computers was the hardware. The software was kind of an afterthought. I mean, it was important to the scientists in that room who were writing software to do a particular thing. But the really interesting development was happening in hardware. And when a, when a university or a corporation bought a computer, they like thought really hard about, we're going to get the, this variety of large object that takes a lot of power and gives off a lot of heat and has to be put in a room with its own cooling system. Um, and then we're just going to write software in assembly language um, as we need it. And when we need to, we're going to trade software with other people at other institutions who have the same computer. And that trading was, was something you did as a matter of course. It, wasn't, it didn't need the name free software because nobody thought of the software as something that you would, uh, except maybe if you work in a you know, nuclear secrets laboratory or something, it wasn't something that you would withhold because we're all helping each other. This hardware costs a lot of money. Let's at least be efficient about using the software. Um, once the hardware commodified, I, uh, I guess that's what that was supposed to show, but I had it in the wrong order. Once the hardware commodified, um, suddenly the software became valuable. And there was a whole argument, actually, which is sort of lost in the midst of time now, about whether software was even copyrightable. Uh, guess who won that fight? Um, so then it became necessary. Once, once restriction of sharing became a kind of default assumption, then it became necessary to codify, for the first time, the sharing that we had been doing up to then. And when I say we, I um, wasn't actually doing it then. I started right after that. Um, but you probably all know somebody who was doing it then. It became, it became necessary to write down, all right, we're going to share, and here are some principles for how we share. So this was the beginning of, this was Richard, Richard Stallman, right here at MIT, actually, uh, coined the four freedoms, I think riffing off Franklin Roosevelt, the freedom to use the software for any purpose. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these. I'm going to go through them very quickly. Um, to study the source code, to, or to study the software is how he put it. He meant the source code as well. Um, to possibly modify it, um, to share verbatim copies, um, and to uh, redistribute uh, modified versions. Um, then, because one term is not enough for a thing, uh, we have a whole different definition, which works out to almost exactly the same thing. You can share it. You get access to the source code. This is from the Open Source Initiative. Um, uh, you can make derivative works, that is to say, modified copies. Uh, 
This is an interesting clause in the open source definition that I always forget about. The integrity of the author's, the original author's source code must be preserved. So like they can request that you distribute the original plus a patch set if they want, and a few licenses do that. Um, no discrimination, by the way, that means no discrimination against people or groups of people, and also no discrimination against fields of use, uh, which is to say you're free to, that's the original of the four freedoms, this freedom zero is you're free to use this for whatever you want. Um, and the license goes with the code. Uh, is there anything else? Oh, that's right, it doesn't, shouldn't affect other code that it's code distributed with. Okay, so it works out to basically the same thing as the four freedoms. Um, and that one, which I always forget. So the funny thing is that codifying that led to a situation where open source software has actually become kind of the default mode of software production. Um, and I'll explain exactly what I mean, because I know, I know what you're thinking. Like, wait a minute, there's a lot of proprietary software written out there. I see a lot of people have, have MacBooks, and like some of the code running on those is proprietary, although a lot of it is open source. Um, but there, there are a couple of ways in which I mean this. One is that a lot of that proprietary code contains open source libraries. They're, they're usually not under copyleft license. Uh, sometimes they are, and they're still proprietary. Um, but, but you just basically can't write new software today without incorporating open source code. You're going to be depending on it somewhere. Um, and also, interestingly, I've run across a number of examples now where someone releases a new piece of software. It's an open source program or an open source library, um, but the announcement doesn't, doesn't even bother to say that it's open source. Like, that's just an assumed background default. Like, you know, here's our new library that does or replaces Docker or whatever it does. That's a real example from a, from a core OS back in the day. Um, and it, it's a very detailed, like, description technically of what it does, what they hope to accomplish. And it is open source license, but they don't even bother to say it in the announcement. That's how easily they can assume that anyone reading this is going to know that it's open source software. Um, the way that I think about this, it's very hard to draw a picture of this, um, especially if you're me and you can't draw. Uh, so I found this outline of a globe somewhere on the internet, I guess, um, is that the, the proprietary software world is a very, very thin shell on the outside of an expanding sphere. And there's like innovation happens at some places on the surface of that shell that the proprietary software innovation happens. Um, and that has a lot of marketing and VC money behind it. And so you hear about it. Um, there, you, you can always think of some, the new thing that they rolled out that is definitely not looking like an open source application. Um, <clears throat> but the inside of the sphere is all, all, all the freely licensed stuff. And it is responsible for the expansion. And as stuff on the surface gets commodified, just like the hardware got commodified, the, what used to be a proprietary innovation becomes free software and gets absorbed in. And we see this open, I mean, uh, educational software, as Justin was saying, is historically an example. Um, the open source is probably now, and I think certainly will be uh, in the future, the kind of dominant mode of, of online course software, because why would you do it any other way? Um, so maybe the easiest way to think of it is, is like proprietary software is that kind of dry, hard, you don't want to eat it, <laughs> rind on the outside. And everything that we're doing, all the interesting stuff, of the, the ultimate site of every innovation in software is going to be the, the, the structured part inside there, the fruit. Um, so now that we've, we've got that, let's zoom in on that structure a bit. A, a bit of research that uh, my, my firm and I were asked to do for Mozilla Foundation actually a while ago was that Mozilla, as you know, they put out Firefox, they put out a lot of other stuff. Um, they have a lot of open source projects and they realized, well, yeah, whenever we start a project, we're just kind of, we're putting an open source license on it and then however the developers want to run it is how they run it. And there's not a lot of thought to like, what is the appropriate like management style for this open source project. I don't necessarily mean governance. Um, it's usually not hard to decide when to accept a pull request or how to, how to you know, choose which way a roadmap is going to go, especially when it's one organization like Mozilla. Um, but there are all sorts of questions about how much to invest in um, documenting the onboarding process for newcomers and things like that. Um, so we, we wrote a report called Open Source Archetypes, a Framework for Purposeful Open Source. I'm not even going to bother to give the URL. You can, you can search it up pretty easily on the internet. And I'm just going to run very quickly through some of those archetypes just to give you a feel for some of the things that we think are, are inside the fruit, as it were. Um, 
So the one archetype was what we called wide open. This is what was classically thought of as an open source project. Um, this is the, we've, we've got a public bug tracker, public repository, documentation, and if you show up and you show some interest, we are kind of willing to make an effort to absorb your contributions. And, which is not a given, like there are other kinds of projects where, especially when it's an individual contributor and, and you know, they might need some hand-holding at first because they're either learning that project or maybe they're learning uh, that language or that programming environment or even programming itself. They might need a lot of help, but they might be a really great contributor someday if you give them that help. Well, how much investment do you make? In a wide open project, the answer is we're kind of willing to make the whole project go a little more slowly uh, in order to be constantly bringing in uh, new contributors and, and making it a long-term sustainable thing with a wide base of developers. Um, I'm not going to talk about every uh, archetype. Uh, I am going to talk about this one a little bit. Um, this is business to business open source, very different from wide open. If you are an individual contributor and you would like to contribute to, say, Google's Android project, which is, a lot of it is actually open source, well, you better know your stuff. Like, they're not, they're not going to spend a lot of time getting you up to speed unless you are Samsung or, or you know, some other uh, device manufacturer or a company with, with like major resource and, and they sense that the, the effort is going to be worth it. Um, <clears throat> so in, in a sense, the B2B open source style is, it is to f businesses what wide open is to individual contributors. Um, and there's nothing wrong with it. It is a perfectly fine way to run your open source project. Um, these, there, none of these are pejorative. Well, maybe one is when we get to the end. But, um, all right, not going to multi-vendor infrastructure. It's a whole other thing you can read about in the report. We're not going to go into it. Uh, upstream dependency. By the way, these are not written in stone. Many projects are a mixture of these archetypes. Also, these are not all the archetypes that exist in the world. Um, this was just kind of our first pass from what we observed. Um, and they seem to ring true to a lot of people. So I think they, they work. Oh, this one. Um, this is the classic like single maintainer maintaining a, a, a JavaScript library on NPM, right? And complaining about how they're burned out from too many pull requests from strangers. Like, that's the single maintainer house plant. That's what we call that. But it's just, that's just one kind of project. It's like when that maintainer either is unable to or fails to try to bring in new maintainers to help out, then you get a house plant. You're responsible for watering it. Uh, and that's, that's just the way it is. Uh, this one I want to talk about a little bit because this is also a kind of classic mode that we see a lot. I would say this. This wide open house plant and, and maybe one other, like the, the ones that are easiest to spot in the wild. Rocket Ship to Mars is a company is doing some kind of new piece of software for strategic business purposes, uh, or not necessarily business, it could be a foundation or, or a government or whatever. But the point is, they know where they're going, they are not seeking input on the roadmap. They have a roadmap, they just happen to have released it as open source from the beginning because for strategic reasons, they want to develop it out in the open under an open license and they want their partners or their customers to know that they could fork if necessary. Um, that's often a good, that's like a kind of insurance that you're giving potential partners. It draws them in because they're like, well, if we invest in this, we won't be left high and dry if they withdraw. We can always take a copy and go on ourselves. <clears throat> but Rocket Ship to Mars is like, they really are not looking for your pull requests. If you happen to learn all the project's inventions and you submit a perfectly well-formed pull request um, at the right time, and it doesn't cost them any extra work and it gives them something they want, then they'll review it and incorporate it. But otherwise, they're probably not going to pay any attention to you. And again, perfectly fine. Now, you want the README to say, we are a rocket ship to Mars. If you're going to Mars, get on board. If you're not, please just lurk and don't interfere. Um, that, it's OK. It's a fine way to run your project. Um, uh, especially our various mass market is, um, that's a little bit like wide open, except uh, less open because it's something like Firefox. Um, <clears throat> and there may be some other examples. It's, it's uh, LibreOffice is another example, actually, which is what I made these slides in. Thank you, LibreOffice. Um, that's when you have way more users than you have potential contributors. Not everyone is a programmer. Most people are not programmers. Most of the people using Firefox or LibreOffice or various other things are not programmers. And so it, the old traditional uh, familiar open source model of like everybody is a potential bug reporter. Well, oh my God, you do not want all the bug reports. You do not want reports from all the people who have encountered bugs in Firefox. That would, you're, you can't buy a big enough server to hold those bug reports or to take that bandwidth coming in. So you have to have triage mechanisms like <clears throat> the users, you know, know someone who's technical and that person makes the bug report or, or, or you collect feedback through surveys. 
uh, or some kind of other random sampling thing. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is getting raspy. <clears throat> um, so that's a very different kind of open source project. Firefox cannot run in the same way that um, the Linux kernel runs. It cannot run in the same way that a component of OpenEdX runs. It's just you've got a whole different sense of scale uh, for the users. Um, um, so I did contrast it with wide open there. Um, or I can talk about trusted water, <laughs> bathwater, the final kind of open source project. You all know this. It's when uh, somebody, or usually an organization, releases an open source project because they are done with it. They throw it over the wall with an open source license on it, and if somebody wants to pick it up, they can, but we are not touching it anymore. Um, so you just throw it out with the bathwater. Um, it's a thing. <clears throat> uh, you're free to do it. It's not really a project. It's more of a, um, uh, <clears throat> a washing of the hands, I guess. So, okay. Um, now we have some idea of some of the n kinds of creatures, aside from individual developers, who are obviously all sorts of people, um, the organizational creatures that are living inside the fruit. Let's, let's kind of analyze the organizational landscape <clears throat> now that we have that. Um, first piece uh, is freedom, software freedom. Like this comes from the licenses. It is the cornerstone. <clears throat> I don't, you can't, without the freedom to fork, and the freedom to use and make modified copies and all that, uh, you can't do anything. So that, that comes before anything else, but it's not the only thing going on. The other thing that's going on these days, <clears throat> sorry for the, the rest. I feel fine, by the way. It's just my, my throat all clogged up. <clears throat> um, the other thing that's going on, and I really want to celebrate this, and a lot of you will have direct experience with these, this is not something known by the wider world, and we should at some point let them in on our secret. We have the most amazing collaboration tools. I mean, never in human history have people collaborated in endeavors of symbolic manipulation the way free software programmers do today. It's incredible. We've got, <clears throat> we've got version control systems that know about every line and character in your file. We can, we can branch infinitely and merge those branches back. I mean, it takes some work the farther out you go, but you can do it. Um, we have uh, bug trackers. We have uh, pull requests, which is basically like, this is, we have a defined package format for submitting changes. By the way, where's Fox? Thanks for lending that, merging that. <laughs> that actual pull request, he merged it this morning, um, or last night. <clears throat> um, uh, oh, not this one, it was a different one, but yeah, but this is, I picked a different one from your tracker. Um, so we haven't, like, we've, we have an actual like, set of standards for taking changes and handing them off to someone else who doesn't need any education in how to read or, or understand the format of the change. I don't, I mean, there have been maybe a few fields where that sort of thing has, has ad hoc <coughs> appeared, but it's really been formalized to an amazing degree in, in free software practice. Um, we, can, we can look at the differences between one version of a thing and the other. So like, how does my change differ from the thing my change is based on? Um, <clears throat> We have chat systems, and those chat systems, by the way, have bots integrated with them that tell us how our deployments and our code changes are going. And like, the bot says something, and then, and then somebody else talks to the bot and realizes what it's doing. Like, it's, it's insane. Oh, look, here you can look at what version on the left, every line on the right of a file, and what date, and who made the change, and what file it's in. Um, and uh, then you can pick a particular change, you zoom in and you can see the diff, you can see the message that someone wrote. Um, you have <clears throat> all sorts of stuff, then you have like people doing summaries in the middle of it to make everything easier. It, it, like, this is incredible. If you, if you doubt how incredible this is, go work in a law firm or, or in a government agency and like, you know, they're collaborating on documents too all the time. They have the same set of problems we have to a large extent. It's problems of collaboration in symbolic manipulation. But the tools they're using, it's like, it's like trying to play the piano with boxing gloves on. I mean, it's just, they're just throwing spreadsheets at each other. And, and, and like Google Docs is, it was an amazing revelation. Um, <clears throat> so that's great. So there's one other thing going on, um, which is that, <clears throat> this is so important, I'll take a drink of water first. And I think that this is also pretty new. Um, we have the situation where the people who work on this stuff when, if they want to leave the organization that currently employs them and go somewhere else, they can take a copy of all the stuff they worked on with them. And that is often why they are being hired. And that's okay, that's even a kind of approved of. People go from Google to Meta to IBM <clears throat> working on 
uh, Kubernetes or the Linux kernel or whatever it is the whole time. Like, they have the same job. They're working with the same people on the same source code, doing the same things, having the same responsibilities, but the employer changes. Well, in that situation, are you capital or are you labor? It's not really clear. Like, with knowledge worker doesn't quite summarize who it is. It's like knowledge bearer, knowledge, knowledge conductor or something. Like, you, you, you do a bunch of stuff in a place, and then when you leave, you take a copy of the capital with you. I think that is really, really important for, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the dynamics, the organizational dynamics that we'll see. So in, in, um, in formal organizational practice, many of you are probably familiar with the, the generally accepted uh, accounting principles. Um, I have a bug on my computer, sorry. Um, I would like to start to explore something which I'm going to call the, for lack of a better term, the generally accepted Libra principles. This is, now this is the part where I'm not so sure about these. There are probably better ones. I'm sure some of you will think of them. Um, but I think this is kind of the next stage that we need in order to, um, to release all of the potential of this kind of, of collaboration in. I need a shorter phrase in collaboration in matters of, of uh, symbolic manipulation. <clears throat> but that is essentially all that, that software programming is. Um, so the first one, this comes from the licenses and, and sort of from what free software means. You have to be clear about who the owner of the device is. Who, who is supposed to decide? So this doesn't just mean that I own my phone or I own a computer and therefore I decide what the software does. Like if I'm renting a cloud server from DigitalOcean, <clears throat> I've signed a contract with DigitalOcean or clicked yes on an agreement and they agree that for the duration of this time, I get to decide what that, some portion of that CPU does and what's on the disk and things like that. Um, I am the authoritative user or you are the authoritative user if you sign that contract. So if, if you don't have clarity on who should be deciding how the computer behaves, you get all sorts of weird decisions. Like even, even Firefox, which is, just kind of surprises me, but like cookies don't cooperate with users often. Like you, you go to a website and you, um, uh, maybe it wants to drop a cookie on your box so that the next time you come to the website, it knows that you've been there before, maybe so it can paywall you after three tries or whatever. Well, look, if they want to have whatever business model they want to have, that's fine. But if I want my computer to not hand a cookie back, my computer should make that easy. My browser should make that easy. It's up to me whether that cookie goes out over the network because I control this device, right? But because browser makers were not completely clear on who they were serving, like is the user the user or is the user the publisher or the website owner, um, we got this weird set of conventions. It's not just cookies, it's like, you know, uh, pop-ups, it's whether, um, whether the back button works, whether, um, uh, oh, what was the, the, the best example was, um, style say again? Style sheets? Uh, style sheets is another, although that's, you know, your computer is sort of doing like you downloaded the thing, so you told me that all. That example will come back to me, but the point is um, lack of clarity on where, sort of where the site of moral agency is in free software can lead to very poor decisions, and it's bad for the ecosystem as a whole. So, and this is, this is something where I'm not suggesting that I have like the answers for the Open edX project or something, it's very complex questions, but I think that this question especially is, is important for a, a learning platform. There are teachers, there are administrators. Oh, by the way, there are students. I almost forgot about them. Like, who is the user for a given component or, or, or server or whatever it is? I, I almost feel like, like in every meeting, there should be an, the initial agenda item is, all right, have we identified who decides what happens with this software? Like, when it's being run, who decides? Not, not us who are designing it, but who's the user? Um, okay, so on from that, that particular um, pedestal, uh, another thing that organizations can do in, as part of our gulp is uh, just be open by default. And many of the organizations here are already doing this. Um, a lot of times when I give a talk similar to this one, uh, some of them aren't. This, this means that like, not just that your code is open source, but that you began development in the open, 
rather than developing, developing, and getting to 1.0, and then dumping a pile of code over the wall that no one's ever seen before. But it also means if two engineers or an engineer and a documenter in your organization are having a design discussion, they have it in the public forum where it's visible to the rest of the project. They don't have it on a private email list internal to your company. Now, there are, there are confidential discussions that you have to have within an organization. This, isn't, this doesn't mean no private conversations. It just means only do them when they're necessary. Otherwise, have every conversation in a place where someone else could see it, where it can be archived, where it can be linked to later, where it becomes part of the shared project history, and other people potentially can join. Um, and that leads to, uh, wherever possible, have development cross organizational boundaries, both within your organization, like division boundaries for large enough organizations, um, work with other developers. I'll talk a little bit more about some techniques for doing that. Um, this one seems key. This is something we talk to, uh, when we talk to tech companies and government agencies a lot about open source. If the, the managers of the engineering teams themselves do not have experience in open source or don't know how to like log into the discourse forum or the, the bug tracker or GitHub and like see what's going on. They don't, they don't have to participate there, but they have to see the same universe that the developers live in or they will inevitably, through this sort of gravitational pull, they will pull the developers back into an internal only mindset. Uh, the managers have a lot of influence. They, they, have, to, they have to at least crawl the walk uh, or ideally walk the walk. Now, again, they may not be doing development themselves. They don't, they don't necessarily have to like, do PR review in public or something. But if they are aware of the universe that their developers are living in, they will be able to make much better decisions about how to allocate time, how much, uh, how much effort a developer should be expected to make to, um, to for example, uh, shepherd a new contributor on board. Um, and potentially that's someone you're going to hire someday, or it's someone who will bring in another organization. Thank you, Nathan. Um, so that I cannot emphasize that one enough. Middle managers need to kind of really be aware of, of open source dynamics. Um, uh, this one uh, is, is about kind of the, the threshold for, for meaningful contribution or meaningful participation. There are a lot of projects where like the amount of time to get the software stood up and, and just like make it do something is, um, uh, takes a while, like you, you do a bunch, of, a bunch of effort and then finally like, okay, boom, now, now you actually have something working uh, and you can try something. The, to the extent, and I don't just mean technical things, I also mean like how hard is it to ask a question and get a meaningful response from the developers or how, um, uh, how long does it take to just read about the software and understand whether it will fit in your organization. Um, the more that the curve looks something like this, the, the more successful an open source project is going to be, also from a business perspective. Um, you're going to get the benefits of open source if you make it a smooth curve. Like the more effort someone puts in, then the more reward they get. And so the, the thing that that also applies to is getting influence in the project itself. Like you don't expect a, a new organization coming in with have their engineers supplied one or two pull requests and then, and now they expect to like have a defining say in the roadmap. No, um, but the more they invest, the more say they should have. And eventually, when you have organizations with real money committed, you have to come up with some kind of governance structure that is able to roughly evaluate how much contribution an organization is making and give them an appropriately sized or, or appropriate number of seats at the table. Um, and I think most of you are figuring out ways to do that. That's, that's long been a, a, a situation that Open edX as a project has been in. Um, but it's just, it's part of, of uh, what is necessary for successful open source projects. Uh, this one, um, I really just want an excuse to, to put an epsilon on a slide one day. Um, the, the thing that happens at zero marginal cost in, in free software is making a copy. You can take the whole project, possibly including even the bug tracker, but at least the source code and all the, like, you know, the documentation. And you press a button and now you've got your own copy and if you need to go off and fork, the license allows you to do that. Uh, setting up an instance will never be as easy as copying. Um, copying really is close to zero cost. The closer you can get instantiation of an instance uh, of setting up your own, your own server or, or local running instance if it's not a, a server, um, however close you can get that to the effort, the very low effort to just copy, 
the better. Um, because nothing interesting happens until people can kick the tires themselves. Like they can, they can look all they want, but, but this, I almost feel that it's kind of like a moral principle. I've, I've seen a lot of open source projects where it's run by one organization. That is to say there is a main instance run by one organization. Everyone knows what domain name on the internet you go to to interact with that instance. And then, um, yeah, the, the code is there. It's in 15 different repositories. They're all under the same open source license. And if you spend a lot of time, you could stitch them together and stand up your own instance if you take five staff members and have them spend a week doing it. Is that really meaningful open source? Uh, maybe it may be in a business-to-business -business open source archetype. It could be. But in general, I would say you're going to hamper, unless your goal is to only have one instance and you actually don't want anyone getting real open source benefit from this thing. Um, but if you do, like you're going to have to make instantiation a little easier than that. So I'll, I'll, for now, I'll tentatively call that a generally accepted Libra principle, but, but maybe we can argue about it in the Q&A. Um, this is more for the people who are hiring the organizations, like the people who would hire your company to set up OpenEdX for them, or hire you to write a custom module for them. Uh, this is some advice we give to government agencies uh, and foundations and, and uh, large tech companies a lot. Um, if you're interested in using an open source project, you're usually going to go and see that there are a certain number of vendors who can supply services. They can, they can set up instances, they can customize, they can do trainings. And often there is a very big frog in that pond. Usually it's the people who wrote the project first, like they're the biggest vendor. Um, but there are others who have, who have come and have services too. It's very important, especially if you yourself are a large procuring organization when you issue RFPs and RFIs, um, don't, uh, don't give them all to that one big frog. Your money is, is a thing that can promote stakeholder diversity within the open source project. Uh, and if you spread it right, you will help keep the project healthy. Hewlett Packard used to have a rule that if they hired you as a vendor, they couldn't be more than one third of your, your annual revenue, or, or maybe it was profit that year, I think it was revenue. And the, the reason was, that wasn't, they didn't think that was healthy for you. If, if they knew that if they hired you and they were that huge a percentage of your um, revenue, that probably when they say jump, you'll ask how high and you'll neglect all your other customers and then in two years, you'll either be tired of being essentially a small department of Hewlett Packard and you'll just stop being there or you won't be giving them as good advice or doing whatever you do because you won't have the diversity of experience in forming it. Um, so open source projects cannot enforce that rule because they are not necessarily one organization. So the organizations that support them need to enforce that rule for them. Um, there's another thing we do, and I'm gonna go very quickly through this because I do want to get to Q&A. Um, sorry, for the hackers in the room, that equal sign with a slash through it means that. Um, uh, Keep project trademarks and company trademarks separate. Um, projects can have trademarks. It makes sense for an open source project and the nonprofit that is the steward of it, if one exists, to enforce that trademark. GNOME does it, other things do it. Um, but the companies that provide services can use that trademark to, in a nominative way to express what they are supporting, but they need their own trademarks for their own services. Don't, don't mix those two. Um, <clears throat> They should be clear about what the relationship is to upstreaming, and I can talk more about this if people have questions. Uh, I think I talked about this before. D um, uh, can't remember if I did, but when an employee leaves your employee, there must not be a non-compete agreement that prevents them from working on the same project for someone else. Like that, you just, you really will kill off an open source project pretty quickly if everyone who works at the original organization that founded the project cannot work on it if they leave there for five years. So what's gonna happen, right? Um, uh, don't set up your own discussion, your own like customer specific discussion forums and documentation sites that are just aimed at your customers except for the parts that are custom really specific to what they need. Um, instead, help guide your customers in and through public forums where the answers that you give to them there will enrich everybody's pool of knowledge and can be linked to and found by other people later. Um, Handling security vulnerabilities, don't be in the position of being an organization that knows a secret vulnerability and that you don't tell the other organizations that it matters. Every project has channels for handling these. Um, you should be in that trusted circle if you are an organization of sort of in the right position, but, um, but sort of behave as an equal in that circle. Uh, no one organization 
should have special licensing rights compared to others. That, that's a really important one. Maybe the, if there is a nonprofit steward organization, then maybe like they have some, they have the right to like relicense from GPL v3 to GPL v4 if that ever comes out or something like that. Um, but you don't want a situation where one organization can proprietarily relicense the code because they've been collecting copyrighted uh, assignments or something, but nobody else can do that because now there's a kind of, they're allowed one kind of fork that no one else is allowed. Um, <clears throat> so, so you can have a, the, a steward organization that everyone helps govern can do it. Um, but otherwise, no, no one vendor should have that. Um, so I think we're almost at the Q&A. Um, this has been uh, essentially, and I usually, I don't like to read from my slides, but I view this whole endeavor as free software and the, the, the practice of sort of large scale organizational free software collaboration is an immune response to monopoly capitalism. And I think it's, it's really important. Um, oh, I forgot all about this slide set. Yes, why do we valorize innovation so much? Um, <clears throat> there's been a lot of books about it. The reason this is important, <coughs> excuse me, is that there's a lot of talk about, you know, how um, the amazing things that are being innovated, I guess that's a, a sort of transitive verb now. Um, uh, there always will be, a lot of that is, is that thin proprietary rind over the alive, interesting, you know, open source core. And all the innovation that's good for humans, if it's going to survive, is going to survive in that open source core. All, maybe all is an exaggeration, but I think the vast majority of it. Um, the stuff that cannot, <clears throat> that cannot flourish in a freedom supporting core of the fruit there is probably not innovation that is good for humans. So <clears throat> um, I just wanna invite you in the little time we have for QA to think about like, what is the structure? What are the obligations we have to one another within in the fruit? Um, and let's talk. Thank you. Great. You're going to be at the conference this afternoon, right? Oh, for a little bit. I have a train this afternoon. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, but I'm meeting with Eden yeah. later. Yeah. Uh, we have time for just a few questions. Um, Carl will be around uh, for lunch, I believe, and a little bit in the afternoon uh, if we don't get to your question. Uh, are there? Carl nailed it. There are no questions. We're all, he's preaching to the choir. I love wow. that. We're all just <laughs> nodding along, right? Yeah, let's do it like that. There's nothing uh, to disagree with in there. Come really? on. Really? Come on. Yeah, come on. Who's, there's no monopoly capitalists in the room that want to take the other side? There, now is the time to out yourself. <laughs> no judgment. There's what, one that, right there. Yeah, exactly about that. So about the um, mo mo monopoly capitalism. <laughs> so there's this this trend in, in open source now that more and more open source software development is moving from smaller vendors to to the big ones, uh, because uh, the big ones do not appreciate the licenses or um, the governance model. Um, so I'm I'm wondering if um, open source maybe ha has failed at uh, destroying the system. Um, uh, what's your take on this? That's, that's um, so uh, more and more like open source development is moving from small vendors to big vendors. I, I'm, I'm thinking of course about Elasticsearch, um, uh, which is being forked um, by Amazon. And mm -hmm. well, open source project that becomes strategic, they oh, are yeah, in danger, of, in, in danger yeah. of being forked and uh, licensed under more permissive uh, licenses. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, um, so that the permissive versus, or, or non-copyleft versus copyleft license question is an interesting one. Um, maybe at, in the interest of time, I won't dive into it. I mean, those permissive licenses or, or non-copyleft licenses, they are still open source licenses. Um, you're, you're right that per, many proprietary services are based on, on software under those licenses. I wasn't expecting miracles from free software. I wasn't expecting, like, I'm not saying that Capitals will be destroyed. And by the way, I'm not a communist. Uh, I'm like, I know that I put a picture of Marx up there. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's a pejorative thing to say that someone is a communist. It's a, it's a reasonable political belief that uh, I think has some, anyway, you, you, you know all the arguments for like. Wow, we're know. really short on time here, Carl. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph Stalin, you do the rest. Um, but but um, what I'm expecting from free software, uh, to the extent that we can kind of that we can develop a shared set of kind of moral organizational expectations is that 
an increasing amount of people's computing lives and the way they interact with communications mechanisms and, and um, symbolic manipulation will be done in systems that respect some fundamental freedoms and that, um, that the, the most, the longest lasting innovations, the ones that are actually valuable for people, will be embedded in that world to an increasingly great extent. Now that is still optimistic, I agree. But on the other hand, like when I go to any cloud computing service right now, I have a choice of boxes to spin up. And it's like, it's a list of free software operating systems, right? And then on top of that, there are these add-on services like Postgres, blah, 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 blah. Now this is all very programmer specific, but still like all the open source stuff is there. And that means that if someone were to fork um, some variety of, well, like GCC got forked years ago, and now the thing that we all call GCC today is actually the fork, it was EGCS. Um, <clears throat> and all those, all those cloud boxes that you spin up where you can build software, some of which involves using GCC, that's the result of a past freedom. I mean, G, you know, the original GCC was also free, there was just a development direction disagreement. So I think there are practical effects, like this is actually happening, and I'm just looking for ways to make it happen in a way that applies to more people than just professional programmers. So that's not entirely satisfactory or optimistic, but you know, small steps. Yeah. Right. Well, oh, sorry, Ned, you, you be in charge. I, I cut Braden off last time. Braden, can you do it quickly? Okay, just really quickly, what do you think about industries like the software that runs your power plants or the trains or your CT scanner mm -hmm. at a hospital, engineering, CAD software? It seems like there's lots of really critical industries that don't use open source at all. Should that change, or is that? Fine? Oh my gosh! Yeah, I mean, quickly. there are a lot of, of yeah. Okay, there are a lot of um, specialist industries. He gave the example of like CT scanners in a hospital. They are not well. They probably are using open source under the, like you know, they're using FFmpeg or, or something like that, right? Um, and and so there is already some software freedom happening. Uh, yes, they should. Um, I would like us to get closer. Um, there isn't space here to talk about all the things we might do to make that happen. Um, some of it could be regular, in the case of medical devices in particular, some of it could be regulatory and I think that would be really great because transparency in medical devices is especially important. Yeah. All right, so thank you very okay. much, okay. Carl, thank you.